Welcome okay. to another episode of Spilling Ink, the talk show that takes you behind the book to meet the authors and professionals in the publishing industry. We're back again with my wonderful co-host, Jason, and the dancing bird, Bella. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Bella, say hi. Say hi. You're not worthy. That's my dog's name. <laughs> Was that that's your dog's name? Yeah, that's my dog's name. Is it really? <laughs> That's a good name. Did the dog answer? It means, it means beautiful. <laughs> well, since Jim spoke up first, Jim, let's have you introduce yourself and tell okay. our viewers a little bit about yourself. Uh, I don't know anything about myself. <laughs> Damn, that's going to be a quick show. <laughs> yeah. My name is Jim Christina. I am uh, a host of a radio show weekly called The Writer's Block. <laughs> I am, I am also, also an author of uh, 14 novels and counting at the moment. Um, and, uh, I do a lot of stuff in uh, libraries and, and do book signings. And I also have a little publishing company, uh, black dog publishing and Tuscany Bay books, black dog publishing, black dog publishing, um, is the name of the actual company. Tuscany Bay books is the label for the, for the books. Okay. Now did, did black dog publishing come from Bella? No, it actually came from my Rottweiler. Ah, okay. Bella's a gold retriever, Katie. Jeez. <laughs> no, Bella's the golden retriever. <laughs> golden retriever. Honest, yes, guys. I mean, come on. I've never seen a black one. <laughs> no. Black labs and golden retrievers are in the same family. No. What? Rottweilers and golden retrievers? No, labs and retrievers. <laughs> she, she meant the dog family. <laughs> <laughs> the animal They're kingdom. both dogs. <laughs> <laughs> They're both mammals. That's right. That's right. Look, they all walk on four legs, okay? <laughs> Anyway, I had we had Katie on our show about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, and she was absolute a delight. Oh well, thank but, you, thank you. Are you sure. talking about, we're Why talking about Katie's latest. Right? We are talking about her. Yes. Oh my god! Wow. Well done, Katie. <laughs> well, I once again fell in love with vampires through her her book. Oh, oh that's I, the way to do it. Yep. Yes. I fell in love with va vampires through her books too. One in yeah. particular named Justine, yes. who's yes. my girl. Yep. <laughs> For sure. I fell in love with Katie by pretending like vampires and hanging around her booth. Oh. <laughs> so, but her books are also great, so it was worth it. <laughs> well, Sean, you are a repeat guest, though no one would recognize you after your new clean cut. That's the idea. I'm trying to get repeat customers, but they don't know it. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about you. Oh, okay. Well, I've written... Um, I've written I think 17 books but they're some of them are like novelettes so they're shorter um so really 14 13 whatever is equal with Jim uh and then other ones <laughs> I want to look good uh but um and I've written in all sorts of genres um I kind of uh, you know science fiction horror uh, uh li I've literary novel um thrillers uh, <laughs> bird related books is that the pope it's like the bird pope anyway uh it is the bird so, pope uh, i've written a book about the bird pope obviously and um no but uh i really I, I love pulp writing and pulp fiction and uh i do um i i do a lot of uh, i do seminars and uh i do presentations at uh comic cons and sell most of the hand sales that i do most of the i mean sorry most of the print books that get sold i sell at conventions and i get a lot of uh, interested uh, readers there by doing presentations and that kind of drives some traffic to my table and people get to learn about writing or whatever the whatever this chubby matter is so yeah uh, mm -hmm. talking about author platforms I'm really excited about it yeah yeah and that's really the the topic we want to address this week on our show is beyond just writing what other ways do we reach out to our readers and get new readers? And just like you said about panels, when you go to shows and you do panels at like a, a Comic-Con or uh, some of the, the big book festivals, people who may not know you will hear you talk and that might trigger a little interest to get them over to your booth later. Right. Uh, even if they don't buy your, you know, buy your book right then, you've, you've, and let's say that that person wants to be a writer or likes learning about new writers and writing, uh, that you've made an, an impression, you know? And someone just taking your card at the table means almost nothing. But if you can make an impression on something that they actually care about, like maybe writing or science fiction or something like that, 
um, then you've got that's I mean, that's the best platform you can have someone associate you with the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. I write haikus at, uh, you know, on the spot haikus at some library events. And it's great. And we have a lot of fun. And you know, but it's not necessarily uh, I mean, it is writing, but it's not really linked to my books so much. So it's lots of fun. And it's getting my name out there and stuff. But it's not the same way that it is like doing something that's really fiction writing related. Well, in my new strategy, I think um, going into this next year is actually to be that I'm going to teach Bella the the dancing cockatoo my one line pitches for all my my books, and I'm going to start taking her out in public, and so everyone who talks to her, she's going to be like, ah, it's a zombie thriller plus arachnophobia, and so she's going to deliver the pitches for me. Oh, and why not? That's, That's the only way you could make that sound less interesting. So I, I think it's. Uh, <laughs> that's, when a bird has arachnophobia, that's saying something. Yeah. So, it's uh, what do you think, Bella? Yeah, what do are you, you think? Using, are you using. Do you use the bird to attract Ooh. attention, though? I mean, in that way? For well, books. the no, not not for books, but she attracts attention anyway. We we go to the to the beach and the and the park and stuff like that in the in the summer. And if we bring her with us, it's just everybody in the vicinity ends up near us to to see the bird because she talks, right. and she loves to interact with with children and talk to them and dance for them. And so, right she, now, leaving the children out of it, I can show up without pants and get a lot of attention. But does it do anything for your books? Well, do you dance? I don't want to talk about that, really. <laughs> well, no, if I do, do you do anything with your books with the bird? I don't. I don't. Well, it'd be it'd be well, she could be on a book cover. I'll just have to write a story about an evil cockatoo. Yeah, I evil. believe it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, now, Jim, tell us about the uh, the Writer's Block podcast and how that got started. Uh, two and a half years ago. We decided to um, put together a show for writers and, and poets, songwriters, uh, script writers, screenwriters, playwrights, whatever, uh, and uh, give them an hour format to come in and talk about their work and uh, what their process is. Uh, a lot of writers like to talk about their work, but they don't like to talk about how they get there. So we talk, as, as we did with you, Katie, we talk about, you know, how your work, how, how you get your, your stories written and, you know, what your day is like and... You know, it's it's getting stuff published and how you do that. And we go through the whole gamut with them. And um, our listeners right now are up almost 500,000. So we have good wow. goodly amount of listeners. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, you've yeah. got, you said that you've written um, 14 novels. Is that right, Jim? Correct. Correct. Okay. What are your What are your novels about? What What genre do you like to write in? My genre is, uh, is a historical westerns. Okay. And they they will they will all be it, with all exception of one or fiction except they do have historical stuff taking place in them. So uh, the one that is not uh, fiction is called Bugles in the Sun. It's about the last twenty days leading up to the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Wow! Seen seen it's seen through the troopers' eyes, not through the officers, not through history books, but through the actual troopers that were there. I want to read that. It's it's actually a pretty good book. Yes. Um, you kind of get uh, what I like about people like you who write Western or, or other things that use some historical data is that you don't have to, you know, one of the things that, things that, uh, that um, writers, fiction writers get a lot is the so what factor, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you incorporate historical things, because I mean, especially American Western history, people are fascinated mm -hmm. with that. I know I am. Mm -hmm. um, it's like you don't, you don't get that. You don't have to have the sort of same justification like this explores something that's inherently interesting to people. Well, you're right, but you also have to look at the the, the westerns that were written back in the '50s and and early '60s, Louis L'Amour and Zane Grey and all those guys. Um, they, I mean, their characters were nice, and they were all tall and square shouldered, narrow hip, you know, square right. jaw, never went to the bathroom, you know. <laughs> those aren't my books. If, and my my catchphrase is, "If you're looking for Louis L'Amour, you won't find him here." Nice. I mean, my guys go to the bathroom, they get shot up, they're ugly, they're short, squat, fat. It's like you Elmore know. Leonard. I like Elmore Leonard's westerns. Yeah, they're just people. Yeah, El yeah. Yeah, they're just people. And, and you know, we try, to, we try to put that across in every book I write, is that, is that these people are just everyday people. And, and it it's, works pretty good. Do you, when you're, when you're starting these westerns, are you mm -hmm. 
kind of looking at actual events and drawing inspiration for those, or, or are they completely fictional? What I do is I pick the period, and I'll find events that happened within that time period. And then we'll incorporate the characters and stuff into the events as they go on. So um, there, in fact, the one I just finished in April and now is up, uh, it's going to be one of four required reading books for Citrus College in Glendora, California, um, oh. history classes. It's called Jonah Blue. And it's a 10-year-old boy who runs away from his family's farm in Ohio in 1830. And he winds up hooking up with a, a mountain man on the Mississippi River and goes up into the mountains with him and becomes a mountain man. Wow. Wow. And that was, that's like six, seven months of research just to get that book written. And that was going to be my next question is going into a, a big project like that. How, mm -hmm. where do you even start with your research? How do you do uh, that? What you want, what your interest is to start. Okay. Uh, you go and I did research the Rocky mountain, the mountain men. And then I found out that they actually had called themselves Rocky Mountain Free Traders or Trappers because there was also the, the, the trapping company trappers that were out there. The free trappers were the ones that were the most interesting because they did what their own thing. They didn't really care about anybody else. Those other trappers were so corporate, man. You know? Yeah, well, they kind Are of were for their time. They kind of were for their time. I mean, you know, they would just come and dump off the furs and stuff that they did. They wouldn't make a whole lot of money because the, the company was already paying them a stipend. So they really didn't, you know, they would go to rendezvous, get drunk and drink up all their profits and be gone. You know, the, the Rocky Mountain free trappers, they didn't do that. They, they kept furs in, in the back. They used to call them traders and they would keep furs back. So if they ever needed to buy anything other than at rendezvous, they had furs to trade for it. Now, is there you now? There, there have been plenty of big Hollywood movies uh, that are focused on on um, you know early American history and and westerns. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you've noticed in all your research that it seems like Hollywood is, or that people in general are are consistently getting wrong or getting right about West life in the Old West? Well, yeah, they they get wrong more than they get it right. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the, the thing the, the most is, is telling is that when you watch a Western, you see them galloping their horses everywhere and they, they just didn't do that. That horse had to last that guy a lifetime, you know, huh. if, without a horse, you, you'd die because there was no way they had no transportation. So your horse was treated. For, you did everything with your horse first. When you stopped for the day, you took care of your animal first. You, t you watered, grain, fed them staked them out to graze, you took care of your animal, then you took care of yourself. Okay. So and that, that makes they, sense. Yeah. Well, sure. Sure. You know, they, they never, uh, they never rode into a ranch yard or a town and just jumped off their horse and left their horse standing there in the street. You know, I can see why a horse do that all the time. So like horse thieves were so reviled and well, they were that important, you know? Yeah. But uh, horse thievery wasn't near as bad as cattle rustling. Oh, really? You know, horse thievery was a hanging offense because if you took a man's horse, well, that's what I'm saying. that was his life. Yeah. You take his cattle, eh, not so much. But you take his horse, yeah. you take his life. You have to ride a cow. That's just not a good look. Right. And, and the language that's, that's, that's used consistently in movies is too modern. What about Deadwood? Uh, what would you think of the language in Deadwood? I, I like Deadwood, and, I, and but I thought, I mean, I, I wouldn't go ever that far. But was you it know? realistic, I mean, maybe? Well, kind of. I, I think I think if you were really, if you lived in a brothel, maybe. <laughs> but um, most guys didn't live in brothels. I mean, they had foul mouths, yes, but there was sure. no women around. You know, yeah. the only women around mostly were whores, and... You know, they didn't care. Yeah, they yeah. used the same language. So, you know, but you would never use language like that around a, a townswoman, ever. You know, would that, would get you, that could get you killed. Oh, well, yeah. You know, well, and most of these guys, on. most of these guys stank. I mean, they smelled bad. You know, they didn't know from washing. They would maybe jump in a river and rinse off occasionally, but with their clothes on. Huh. Because that's how they got their clothes clean. You know, so. <laughs> what about the, the idea of, you know the the gunslingers and the the nah. showdowns and stuff like that. Does any of that have nah. any truth to it? No. Nah. No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jason. It just didn't exist. <laughs> You're ruining Hollywood for me. <laughs> Poor Jason. 
which the harsh reality has ruined you. The gunfighters weren't gunfighters. Most people who lived by the gun were called gunmen. And they, they weren't fast draw artists. Um, they were just deliberate. And that, would, that was more you would find most of your, uh, most of your, um, your gunplay was either alcohol or somebody deliberately shot somebody else for whatever reason they had money or whatever reason. Huh. But it was it was more a walk up and shoot him than it was a draw out in the street. I don't think that I think that happened one time with Wild Bill Hickok. That, that, that was it. That's not particularly sporting, is it? No, no, it's... no. But there wasn't a whole lot of sportsmanship. No, <laughs> you know? I guess you, you know, know what he got shot to death, but he got a ten on form, and that's what's well, important. you got shot somebody, he was pretty much dead. So, wow. Well, yeah, I if the, if the bullet didn't kill him, then the lead did. So. I think that, yeah, the end results matter there. Is he dead? Yep, we're good. Dead is dead. But we're a lot of these guys, it took days for them to die. Yeah. It, I mean, some of these guys, it took days and days for them to die. Now, why, uh, do you think, why do you think life was so cheap back then? Because it was such a struggle to survive? Or what do you attribute that to? I don't know that it was so cheap at all, Jason. What I think it yeah. was, it was, just, it was just life. Okay. You know, that was their life back then. Things were hard. It wasn't, it wasn't a simple life. And, you know, anything, anything could happen to you. You could fall off a wagon and get run over. You know, so I don't know that it was ever cheap. I, I think uh, if the cheapness comes in, it's, from, it's strictly from the saloons and the alcohol involved. Uh, you know, because even as to today, most people can't hold their liquor. Well, that's, you know, there are, there are some of us who can. Uh, most people, they, they don't do well. <laughs> well, if I can help, I try not to mix liquor and guns in the first place. Well, that's a smart thing. That's okay. a good idea, Sean. So I usually guns out of the house because, you know, liquor could happen at any man. moment. So we don't want <laughs> Liquor could <laughs> happen at any moment. <laughs> but gunplay, that's just, you know, that has too many con. Unlike drinking, gunplay has consequences. <laughs> well, you know, when you think about it, when you get so pissed off at somebody and you're carrying a gun. It'd be easy you know, to get to that. It, it's to very that. easy to yank that pistol and... and then yeah. then what are you going to do? Well, that's why, yeah, it's like if there's a gun, somebody's probably going to use it. Exactly. So we rely on our so, wits around my house, which so very most of the town caliber, I outlaw them. Yeah, most of the towns had no gun ordinances, so you yeah. couldn't wear them in town anyway. Now, they did what even do you, back then? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, even back then. Huh. Huh. Wow. I've learned it's, a lot. Yeah, yeah, I have to. <laughs> I just like how far off tangent we get. We talk oh. about radio shows. Next thing you know, we're talking about gun ordinances. Well, and... oh, wait, oh, so next, okay. I have a question for Jim. Sure. Jim, okay. Well, this is lead us back in. Uh, Don't get political, Sean. Western... Huh? Don't get political. No, 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 no. Do you ever <laughs> go to any Western, like, you know, any Western sort of uh, themed events or anything and, and talk about your books? Yes. Oh, um, I, 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 I've, I've done a few library readings and, and library uh, talks. Are um, they old I West, did, like theme things? Yeah, there it was totally old West. Um, I did one um, uh, real versus real. So in other words, R E A L versus R E E L. Um, I did a thing at uh, a big big event. It was it was at a, it was at the back room of a restaurant. Huh. Um, and Roger McGrath, who was from the History Channel, he was there that night with us, and we had a little chat yes, back and forth. on the platform. Yeah, and then we also do the Santa Clarita Cowboy Festival every year at the Buckaroo Bookshop. So, and, the Buckaroo uh, it's Bookshop? Awesome. It's actually a, a book tent that is set up, and it's a bookstore for two days. Oh, cool. Now, is yeah. this, so this was clearly after you ruled the galaxy for 30 years uh, during the first Star Wars trilogy, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I had a thing. I wrote a book on how fishing is misrepresented in movies, and I did a real versus real thing. It was R E A L versus R E E L, but it was really uh -huh. confusing because we weren't sure what was real versus real. We just had to give right. up. <laughs> and, uh, that was at the Buckeye Bookshop, which they set up in a kiddie pool. Outside of Walmart, we don't really talk about it much anymore. But. Sean, dude, <laughs> Jim, how do you how do you get the word out about your books? We, we you you're doing some library stuff. You're doing some some uh, yeah thing. Yeah, we we do. We, we I, I push them on our, our radio show, as as uh, Eddie can tell you. Um, we also have a little publishing company that uh, we tout 
is there are titles, which a lot of my titles are there. And, um, and then we, you know, shameless self-promotion, the three biggest words you can have if you're an author. <laughs> now, now, do you, oh, is that true? <laughs> do you get into the, into social media a whole lot, Jim, or no? I do. I, I have a, I have an author webpage and I have uh, my black dog book webpage and then our radio show, uh, Facebook page. And then my personal Facebook page. Is it blackdogbooks.com? It is blackdogbooks.com. Uh, yeah. No. Yes, blackdogbooks.com. Oh, there's some suspense no, there. I'm sorry, Black wait. Dog Publishing. Oh, wait a minute. I'll get it. It's blackdogpublishing.co. Okay. Ah. <laughs> Sean, did you send Jim some of whatever you were doing today? <laughs> a little bit. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> no, I, no, no, no. Uh, I've yeah, been up I'm, since like 3 o'clock. So I'm high on like, light. Uh, and when I say light, okay, I yeah. mean a pile of light. <laughs> but, yeah. um, no, I don't. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm Jim doesn't. No, I'm sure. Actually, you know what the hardest part though about making a movie about fishing is, right? The casting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Woo I'm at SeanHo.com. They're better than the jokes. And and this is what we can expect when we go see you at the library, Sean. Yes, more fun than a barrel of in a waiting more pool. More clever than monkeys. <laughs> in a waiting pool, talking about casting. So. So there Sean, you you're doing you're doing events at libraries too. Who? <laughs> you, Sean. Me? Yeah. Oh yeah, I do. I do a lot of events there. I I, uh, I go to the I was at the Vegas Valley Book Fair uh, Book Festival. I mean, past what? What? Katie, you were there. Yeah, it was uh, like two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, and had a great time. And I just generally, because I'm so successful, um, I uh, I do it for the library to kind of get attention for them at their booth, and I do oh, these to give back. impromptu haikus. If you give me any subject. Other than anime, um, I can I can write you an impromptu haiku about it, and I did like eighty in a couple of hours. It was a lot of fun, and you know. So then, I mean, then you know, they carry my books, and people know me from the from the writing and things like that. So it's good. The shameless self promotion, as Jim was saying, you know, accent on the shameless is mine, and uh, I'll do anything to make kids laugh and and you know, hey. make their parents feel guilty and buy my books. Shameless self promotion. <laughs> That's true. That's I mean, yours is required reading in a college. Mine doesn't even require reading in my house. <laughs> so. well, that's only one that's required reading in a college. Oh, okay. You know what, though? It, it, the, the way that the market is, you almost have to do anything possible to get right. attention, to get people to look at your books. So, I mean, shameless, that's the word. That's, you absolutely have to just say, well, screw it. I will do whatever it takes. We, if we, you're not I, I willing to... Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, if blah, you're blah, not blah, willing blah. to, there's another author in your genre who is. And <laughs> Oh, sure. You know, it get books in hands. I mean, if you're a good writer, there's nothing to feel guilty about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, there's, right. And then yeah. of course, there's Jason. <laughs> That's right. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so kidding. I love Jason. I'm just joking. Hard. <laughs> well, my newest, my newest experiment was actually... Um, suggested to us and uh, outlined to us by one of our guests um, last week and he was talking about reader magnets which is once you explain it, it it seems really simple but it was a term that I hadn't heard before so I was like oh this is kind of cool so the idea behind the reader magnet is that you have a short story or a uh, excerpt from a from a novel and you make that available for free for potential readers to download from your website or from um, book trafficking sites like InstaFreebie and BookFunnel. And you load it up with the, the links to your other books at the end and say, hey, you know, if you like this, you know, check out these other books. And so not only are they they reading that book, but when they download it, at least on InstaFreebie and, and BookFunnel, you get their email address so that you can notify them when you have more books coming out. Mm -hmm. um, which I thought was a great idea, and I was like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to try it right away. So uh, for the past few days here, um, I put a, a short horror story that I had written um, that was previously published by an, an anthology, and their um, their exclusivity period has, has been up now. Um, so I put that up on fr Insta Freebie, and I've been kind of promoting it on Facebook and asking friends like um, Katie and some others to, to help me share around, and... I find that I'm having a lot of people download it, and of course, as soon as they download it, I get their email address, so that 
as I'm starting to develop a new newsletter, which I don't have right now because I never felt like I had great content for a newsletter. Um, but so now I can contact them and say, hey, you know, if you liked what, Lot 187, which was the short story, you know, check this out. This is in that same vein. Um, so, so far I'm having fun with it and people are downloading the book, which is all I can ask for. And something that you're doing that I think is, that all sounds really great. And something I think that you're doing with that, and of course this is part of probably why you do it, right, is that you have trackable results. It's not just you're not like just handing out, you know, CDs or something. Not anybody does it anymore. But CDs with a free book on it. I mean, you've got, oh, this person was interested in this book and downloaded it or accessed it or whatever. And you've got their email. You've got, yep. you know, then you can put them on a mailing list and you can track what interests they have or if they unsubscribe immediately or whatever. But and, yeah. and then, you know, that if they interact with your mailing list, that they're interested in your work because they've already read some of it. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so I that sounds I'm going to have to try that. That's, and that yeah, actually yeah. puts the lot. I mean, I was just joking, but it puts the lie to it. When you, when someone knows you're putting free content, a reader knows you're putting free content out there for them to look at. Well, that shows that you have confidence in the work you're doing, yeah. and that if you like this, which you probably will, then you'll love this other stuff that's behind whatever paywall or whatever. So yeah. I think it's a good idea. I, I, like I, said, I was really impressed by the idea, and I was shocked that I hadn't heard it before. I was like, oh, well, yeah, that's that's a no brainer. Of course, I'm going to do that. So. Uh, so yeah, so hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll see some good results from that. But I'll, I'll keep us posted throughout the the months and and see how it goes. I'm gonna try to what what I'm gonna do with the newsletter, and I, I'm subscribed to a zillion author newsletters because of course whenever you, you're befriend an author, you get signed up for their newsletter. <laughs> right. um, so I don't necessarily know that I'm gonna do something every week or every two weeks, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put out a newsletter when I have something worthwhile to share. I'd love to be able to share a, a, a short story with people every month or a cool epic poem every month or just something that's interesting, something more than, okay, I'm selling this and this and this this month. Right. You can't just do the constant sales pitching. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because right. we all get tired of that. You know, I want Katie you to buy my books, but I don't, you know. <laughs> Katie has a great balance with her stuff, I think. No. She has a great balance? No, no. balance. Her, her no balance? balance. The braids are balanced very well oh, tonight. Wait, well, no, wait, <laughs> I thought you were Back to the hair up. again. <laughs> I must be thinking of someone else. I'm sorry. Sorry, Heidi. <laughs> I, I I'm just there. glad you brushed your hair today. That's oh, all. Oh, there it is. Well, as we all know, Katie is terrible at doing that. Moving on. <laughs> what was it? You guys called me a, a nest hair last week? My, my <laughs> bird's nest I had going on last week. Dude, He's got birds on the, on the mind there. <laughs> no, um, I, I don't really have a balance anymore because I haven't been paying attention to my newsletter. But what Jason's talking about is absolutely correct. It's getting those people to sign up for the newsletter and then finding a way to filter them in. Now, step two on that process that we talked about last week was once you've got their email, then you create an automation. So you've got maybe one or two automatic emails that go out after they sign up that say, hey, thanks for reading such and such book. If you like this, here's some of my others. And then maybe a week or two later following up with, you know, have you had a chance to read this? Please leave a review. Or would you like to hear about more and more of my books? That kind of thing to engage them on an automatic level so that you're not constantly having to send out hundreds of emails because, you know, people like they love free stuff. So you'll get a million subscribers for three for free things um, and that's a way to help filter them down into actual real readers without having to maintain the the weekly or monthly however you want to do it newsletter um, some authors they do have that every week newsletter and that becomes a little bit hectic to deal with some authors have the once a month you know hey this is what's going on here's my sales here's my deals whatever and some have the very conversational newsletters which are essentially like blog posts where they Those are great. check in with their readers every so often. And then casually at the bottom of their newsletter, they have, by the way, here's all my links if you want to check out my books. Well, Ellen Preston, who was, who was on a, a few weeks back now, um, I think that she has a newsletter that comes out twice a month. And she was telling us that she has a very specific format that she uses. And part of the reason that she feels her newsletter is successful is because the readers know that format. They know what to expect. And her format, I believe, and it's been a few weeks, was that 
she starts out by by giving some kind of personal anecdote, you know, something that's going on in her life, you know, connecting with the readers. Um, then she talks about what she might have coming up and releasing, you know, new releases or sales going on. And then she always has a giveaway as well. At the end of every newsletter, whether it's just her giving away or whether it's a giveaway with a big group of authors, there's always a giveaway. So there's always that incentive for okay, I'm going to open Ellen's newsletter because I know she's giving away, you know, a book or a gift card or this or that. And so I thought that was interesting too. Now, I, I have nowhere near enough time nor ideas to come up with something twice a month, um, but I think it's fantastic that she's got something that's working for her like that. Now, let me yeah, add a caveat I, there. I, I, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, just want to add a quick note there, and that's one of the reasons that I haven't done my newsletter in a while. Um, if your readers are so used to always having an incentive in your newsletter, beware that the one time you may not have an incentive, you will get hate mail. And that was kind of what stopped me. I had sent out just an informational newsletter. And actually, Jim, it was because I was going on your show. Uh -huh. I had sent out, hey, I'm going to be at the Las Vegas Valley Book Festival doing a panel. I'm going to be on the Writer's Block show, um, just in case you want to tune in or be there. And I didn't have any giveaways at the end. It was simply an informational, hey, this is going on. Oh, and I instantly yeah. got hate mail telling me how stupid my newsletter was and how worthless it was because there was nothing uh, to give away. And so I kind of just went, I'm going to back off from the newsletters for a little bit. Hey, Katie. You know, people are such you, jerks. Katie, you know what you got to do? You've just got to shake it off. Shake it <laughs> off. Shake it off. <laughs> Shame you know, haters going to hate <laughs> <laughs> I uh I that, you know what that's a really I don't think they're real friends to you. If uh I mean yeah, you don't need friends like that, frankly. Something tells uh, me they weren't real readers. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking. I uh I <laughs> I um have a con I had a contest at the end of my newsletter and it's first place, first prize was one of my books. Second prize was two of my books, which was <laughs> Interesting, and we really, really respond to that by not even reading the blog entry. So, so I feel good about it. I'm not really sure why I brought that up, but uh. <laughs> what was third prize? Three of your books? Yes, yeah. It just goes on and on. It's a, uh, it's a reverse lottery. So the idea here was to lose, and get all of your books. I mean, that's my branding. So. <laughs> you know, I I feel like Sean, you need to team up, team up with Jim. And create a western where it's the lone cowboy riding his horse very slowly through the desert, being chased by Cthulhu. I, I feel like I, that someone would be has done that. By what? Cthulhu, man. <laughs> I know you've got a Cthulhu over there. <laughs> Why, as in this great book, Cthulhu attacks by. Oh, it's me. Oh, oh yeah. but wait, it's wait! Wouldn't book. Cthulhu be powerless in the desert? No, 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 no. Remember, he was trapped underwater. Yes. Not actually, he, uh, August Derleth, as we all know, considered him an, an, a water elemental, but that was a misunderstanding. Well, and see, Katie, the deal is that Nikola Tesla created these big towers that broadcast power into the sky for everyone to tap into. So Cthulhu mm -hmm. taps into that electricity from the desert and it's uses true. it to chase this I mean, dummy. Obviously. <laughs> 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 I have a, I have a Tesla books. I, I mean, I'm working on a, a trilogy right now that my Kickstarter supporters are so interested in hearing about. <clears throat> but uh, it's, it's coming, it's coming. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's. I, but people have done the the Western mashups are really fascinating because uh, they've done with all sorts of things. Uh, Cowboys versus Aliens, weirdly, was not very good, but it was a great no. idea. Did well, you see it could have been better if you're just looking at it as. A flashy action film it was fun but there there wasn't much more to it than that i don't think. No, and it wasn't even a fun action film it was a kind of grim but yeah i like i like um did you ever see uh did you guys and i'm sorry it wasn't the book it was a movie but ravenous did you ever see that movie jim yeah it was no set in the, i don't recall the, with was that harvey Keitel or who was that that was in that the no movie? it was um uh guy pierce Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was set like around the time of F Troop, like 1840s. This is my historical, by the way, Jim. This is my historical uh, sort of reference. Oh, oh, oh that's Troop. that's the guy that that's the guy that was eating all those people. Yes, 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 yes. I, I love did that. see that. So, uh, it was a great mashup, and it was so such a good desolate Western feeling. Yeah. 
Well, it was infinitely better than than Dracula meets Billy the Kid. It, oh. it was. It, I've it never was seen that. What about uh, Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln Vampire Slayer? Oh, well, that was. Uh, I, I wanted would to like that one. I wanted to, but I just couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to so bad, but no, I couldn't book. get through it, Katie. The book was pretty good, actually. The book was good, but the book was like obviously it's a humorous thing, but the book was like a history book, and it's hard to make movies just out of a history book. Right. Well, I guess the coolest part of that movie was just the part on the trailer where Abe blasts through the tree with one swing of the axe. Abe, <laughs> that was yeah, the coolest remember, thing. That's like when, well, in, uh, yeah, when G Man was cutting down the uh, cherry tree, and Tommy <laughs> was. Uh, I didn't go on first name basis with all these guys. Well, you know, the sad Abe. part about it is it came out the same time that Abraham Lincoln came out. Yeah. So, I mean, on one hand, you have Abraham Lincoln, vampire killer. and the other hand, you have Daniel Day-Lewis as Abraham Lincoln. I know. That, that Spielberg Lincoln. movie could have been a success if it hadn't been ruined by <laughs> the first one. By, by Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> exactly. It was a very confusing <laughs> time in cinema. But you know what, Sean? <laughs> Abe and I are on a first-name basis here, though. Every, every February, uh, my birthday is in February, we have the BFF birthday bash. Because my, my friend Jason was also born in February, and, well, I guess we never really researched it, but we think Abe was also born in February. It's so February we always, 12th. Yeah, 12th. So we, we always add him to our BFF birthday bash poster, so it's like he's hanging out with us. I'll post a picture on it before. Yeah, I always add a couple of, like, Playboy models to my birthday pictures to kind of spice <laughs> them up a little bit. Weirdly, though, they're also named Abe. Oh, nice. That's, that's a weird thing. <laughs> that's sexy right there, buddy. Did you know? Well, you didn't know. February 12th, 1809, Abraham Lincoln was born. And on the same day, Charles Darwin was born. Two of the most epochal minds of the 19th century. Born on the that's same right. day to the same woman. Well, not that last part, but <laughs> other than in that. The in the same cabin. In the same <laughs> It was a crowded cabin. I, I don't know if I'm comfortable with Sean using big words. Well, <laughs> you should go just confront yourself then. Well, he's drinking big beer, so might as well have big words too. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is just iced tea. This is uh, oh. Vegas tap water, right here. Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that pretty much looks like it. Yeah, like I say, have you been to Flint, Flint Michigan? System, <laughs> Hi, how are you? Hi, she saw the beer. She wants them. Uh -oh. Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> Someone was trying to teach her that at the, the vet's office I worked for the other that day. That is so racist, man. <laughs> Just because she's a white bird. I mean, come on. Come here. Come here, baby. I, uh, I have a book on Darwin, Darwin's Dreams, which is my literary novel, historical novel, and I, would, I don't have a copy of it here because they all sold out. <laughs> yeah, um, nice. it's, uh, I, it's, it's really, it's the best book I, or indeed anyone else, has ever written. It what's it, what's it called? I'm sorry that I don't have a. You should, people should buy a copy right now, and if it's not the best book they've ever read, I will give them their money back. Nice. Yes. Wow. You know, didn't you tell me that you actually do say that at conventions sometimes? That yeah, if you don't, I say that every you're... time. Uh, to, there's like I have a 100% money back guarantee, and they're always like, "Oh no, I wouldn't." I'm like, "That's great. I hope you know. Obviously, I, I hope, hope you don't. don't but... <laughs> but it's like if you honestly, and only one person's ever taken me up on it. And I had him killed. No, only one person's taken me up on it. And uh, it was a teenager person who at the con, they were sorry they spent the money because they wanted to buy something else. It was fine. You know, so I just gave him the money back and, and uh, tore the page out and sold it for half price to somebody else who who didn't. Oh, because you'd already signed back, it. So. Sure. Huh? <laughs> you already signed it. I already signed it. Well, I ripped that page yeah. out because I wrote to Dimbalb or whoever that guy's name was. And uh, I'm I'm having some revisionist history on this, obviously, but uh, yeah, but um, and it's, and it's and I do and I mean it. It's 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 Stop it's a good thing. I like to put people at. Uh, did that bird steal your watch? Well, yes. You see, the pro the thing is, it's it's one of the little Apple watches. So if I get a message on my phone, it buzzes. Well, she felt it buzz on my arm and <laughs> decided that I'm going to take that watch. <laughs> You yeah. know what? You gotta get your buzz where you can get it. That's right. <laughs> Although Katie obviously is against this because it's Apple. Yes. <laughs> I was just about to say she realizes how evil the watch is, and she's trying to help you by getting rid of it. Yeah, I'm well, helping you by sitting on this buzzing thing 
this is terrible. Please stop. Well, you should see the. Can you? I don't know. Can you guys see that big tear she made in it the other day? Oh. Oh yeah. Evil little, little bugger. It's a good thing it's patented gorilla glass, strong enough to take a cockatoo bite. <laughs> That's wow. a good slogan. <laughs> It, it really, it's, is. it's gonna get that cockatoo owner market that's so coveted. <laughs> it's it's gonna it's kind of a saturated market, you know. <laughs> but yeah, what do you think? We're making fun of you. Yeah, she's gonna take your eye. You know that, right? Yeah, she could. Holy crap, man! Dude, yeah. Somebody, a, a friend of ours, has a, a bird called a hyacinth macaw. And have any of you seen the movie Rio with the the parrots oh, in it? It's yeah. a cartoon. All right, you know, in that movie, there's a blue macaw, which kind of loosely based on the hyacinth macaw, which is a gigantic parrot. Very intimidating looking bird. Is, it, a, in the, is it in the witness protection program? Is that they call it a macaw? <laughs> <laughs> He's actually a parrot. <laughs> well, well, they're a type of parrot called a oh, hyacinth macaw. Um, but anyhow, where, where was I going with this, Sean? Oh, uh, yes. Is that your author so, platform? No, no, no. We're not talking about that kind of stuff. All oh, right. So sorry. you guys so are just anyhow, completely off topic. <laughs> your bird is based so, on a movie bird. Or something. So I'll, I'll, OK, I'll, I'll be quick, Katie. Sorry. So a friend of mine was telling us just the other day that her husband has one of these birds and they're endangered and they're super expensive. They're like 15 grand. So you've got to be really nice to him. And the bird doesn't like her, hates her. So one day she was walking across her living room and this bird darts out from the other room, runs up to her foot, and bites her, her big toe. Well, they've got like 1,500 pounds of, of pressure in their beak. So she ends up with, in the emergency room with stitches going all around her foot. And the doctor's like, we can't believe they didn't just take it right off. But anyhow, what were we talking about, Katie? Uh, oh, wait, can I just say something? Yes. That bird being worth $15,000 is the only reason it's alive, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I would think wow. so. <laughs> yep. So yeah, so I think we'll all sell more books knowing that. <laughs> and maybe buy ourselves a macaw. There you go. There you go. Did, oh, hey, Jim, in the Old West, in the Old West, did they use falcons at all? Did they use what? Falcons to hunt? I, I don't think they did in, on the Old West, but I think they did in Europe. Well, yeah, right. I mean, I didn't just come up with the idea of falcons hunting. I'm just like... <laughs> That'd actually be kind of a cool thing to put into a story, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would. You know, you I... do that and give me credit. <laughs> you could call... You could name the, the falcon David and have it be where the hero gunslinger uses this bird to fight a major battle before he, he runs off to fight against uh, Randall Flagg. Randall Flag. That's a Did you Stephen King Flag? reference. Have we not read the Gunslinger series? <laughs> Randall Flag would be making reference to the Stand. The Stand. Well, yes, yeah. but he he was kind of he's been a recurring character. I think in the Gunslinger they just called him Merlin, but it's been inferred that they they were one and the same. But they do actually call him Randall Flag in the Stand, which is why we thought you were referring to that. Yeah. Right. The well, book with him in it. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, in book four of the Gunslinger series the one of the cowboys has a falcon that he uses to fight with oh, so cool. that, that's yeah anyhow wow that would have been really fascinating 10 minutes ago <laughs> <laughs> anyway katie how you doing i'm just listening to the crazy going on over here oh, i don't even have to talk today i can just kind of sit here and you guys just keep it going oh, katie, I don't <laughs> what are you doing to engage your readers katie well honestly spilling ink is one of our, our ways to engage readers what is that Really? Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> it, it's not only a way to engage readers, though, but it's also a way to build your author network, which we've talked about before. It's not always what you know, it's who you know. And sometimes the network of people you bring in can help you in reaching new readers and building an audience as well. And finding more places to promote yourself and, and you know, your, I mean, have your author platform. When you meet into new whole new groups of writers through a writer friend that you've made, exactly, and it's uh it's great. I don't think I mean, she likes a whole Phoenix like there's a whole Phoenix crew, if you will, and uh, yeah. I talk at you know at the, well we went to Phoenix. Remember? That's a Yo. P for Phoenix. 
That looks like a G because it's backwards. Or but F for anyway. Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> or I for Indianapolis. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> anyway, I don't even know what I was saying. It was worthless, whatever it was. <laughs> Something about Phoenix. But you're you're talking about how oh. we went to we went to Tucson, Sean, right. Tucson. and we did the uh, the panel on self publishing there. Right, and in Phoenix, yes, thank you. And in Phoenix, whoa! <laughs> 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 what happened? You know, uh, whoa, shit! I mean, gosh! <laughs> Wait a minute. What? Where was? It? What program is this? <laughs> oh, good lord! Oh no! I'm so sorry. Let me see. Am I still on the? Camera? Well, I don't know how things see a work. Really, oh, damn it, Apple. A really goofy looking picture of you. <laughs> oh, there, wait, here we go. Am that I'm is back? the, the best back? picture okay. right there. <laughs> what, what was it? What was it it was you with glasses looking like, I don't know oh. what you look like, man. <laughs> looking like I found a weasel in my shirt or something, yes. <laughs> like a homeless True guy. True story, we'll talk about that later. There you go, there you go, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, to, to bring that back on point, the the building oh. your your platform using your author yeah. connections as well is very helpful. And yes, Spilling Ink gives us a chance to not only reach out to other authors, but also shamelessly self-promote ourselves. Yes. Yeah, it's hard to shamelessly self-promote others, but yes. Uh, it. But I. But actually, going to Tucson with you, it's like, until I was a jerk in the car, we, I mean, we really bonded and I got to know uh, Ms. Johnson and uh, you know and other writers who i wouldn't have met without you know knowing you and and what was the freeway number again it was either 215 or 515 <laughs> there's someone who lived here since she was an embryo and I, <laughs> a couple of years ago in my defense though i'm a jerk oh my god you were like so jumping to defense though you're like i will i will make you pay for every one of my books if you get this wrong and i'm like dude i've lived here forever <laughs> it was i blame society <laughs> uh, so jim what does it take to get on your radio show out there in la how do you how do you get people for the show how do you do that uh we have uh actually um my booking manager and producer is my wife well that was and you gotta get you gotta get past her first <laughs> and she's pretty discerning but she's uh we're but right now we're uh we're taking uh, applications for 2018. We're already booked up through April of next year. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. So how does one yeah. apply on that? Um, You can send an email to guest, as in, you know, guest services, or guestwb at yahoo.com. Oh. I'm just curious for someone else. Now, we'll, we'll put a link at the bottom <laughs> of the uh, video so that our, our people oh. watching can easily access it once it goes yeah and uh it's 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 she uh she right now she's not uh doing anything with any new writers until after december 1st so what's her name she's she just so get on loaded. the waiting list and yeah, it's getting crazy. long what's her favorite kind of flower again yeah. who my wife yeah rose <laughs> okay good also, i like this they're we, already planning their ways to suck <laughs> up this is good Jim, we you actually wait recently not that you needed to but you're looking, you're looking good. Yeah, buddy. you do look very dashing, Jim. <laughs> well, Jason thanks. is sucking up. Don't listen to him. <laughs> so along with shameless self-promotion, you also have to be willing to suck up to anyone around you. I, That's I, I true. Practice, I'm generally shameless. So. Well, you know, if you're if you're a master in in the art of of of, of bullshit, then I suppose you know you'll fit right in. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That's like my son. Think, he was uh, he's making his own money. And grandma comes over today and he hands grandma this, this bill that he made. And he said it was an $8,000 bill and he would like to give it to her if she would give him $12 back. Isn't that how Bitcoin works? <laughs> I think that is how Bitcoin works. <laughs> that kid is going to be a billionaire, man. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, isn't he like two? No, he's he's almost six. Oh, I oh, thought he well, was a baby. I was like, man, that baby's a genius. He's like boss baby and stuff. I was like, I was like eight before I got into counterfeiting. <laughs> oh, he's he's counterfeiting at a twelfth grade level. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, you must be so proud. <laughs> uh, Honey, we have a con artist in the family. Aren't you proud? <laughs> Uh, Despicable Me, Despicable Me Four, featuring the Salitises. Yes. There you go. 
as, as long as <laughs> as long as what's left of the FBI doesn't come knocking on your door. Nah. Um, Actually, yeah. do you know who prosecutes? You, I bet Jim. I bet you do. You know who prosecutes counterfeiting? Uh, Treasury Department. Secret, Secret Service. Service. Secret Service. Secret Service. No, you don't get credit, Jason. Ah, uh, your bird does. All right. But, Good job, yeah, they're, they're so. <laughs> I thought yeah, I was, a, but I only know that because of uh, Wild Wild West. Wild Wild West. It's the Wild oh, Wild West. Yeah. yeah. That's a realistic Western for you. That was good. You know, they, were, the original they had to wear the collars. I mean, Bob the, Conrad was the, anyone the, the, slimmer of waist and, you know, wider of shoulder than he? Well, he had to. <laughs> yeah. Anything to make him look bigger. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Where's where's Bob? Oh, someone put in his pocket, you know. <laughs> they had to use miniature batteries on his shoulder. Those of us who are old enough to remember that commercial. Which oh, that's right. Jason that's right. Said, yeah, knock him off. Yeah. I dare you. I dare you. Yeah. See, uh, well, Jason then he started flying airplanes. no for... idea what we're talking about. I don't know what these old guys are talking about, Katie. Oh, good. Finally, we're not the old ones. <laughs> Actually, I think that oh, no. I, I think that Sean is actually like twenty. He's just had twenty years of hard living, right? <laughs> I did, I did. As uh, uh, I remember, we had a reunion of our embryo gang, and uh, I was like, I was voted uh, most likely to get his head caught in his crib. And uh, it was, but I made it, and I'm feeling good. I don't know what that joke meant. Uh. Read my books. They're funny and awesome, by the way, folks. <laughs> Author platform. See, it's all relevant. There you Master go. Master of the shameless self-promotion right here. I'm a giver. I'm a giver, Jim, just like oh. you. Yeah, I give. <laughs> I give until it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> until it hurts them. And then I give some more. All right. Well, since we're coming towards the end of our hour here, let's finish up with um, both of you guys letting us know when your next appearances and or online shows will be so that we can clue our, our viewers in to find you next time. Sean, oh, go for it. Wait, wait, yeah. wait, wait. We, we never even, we never heard what Sean writes though. We got to hear what he writes. Uh, well, I was talking about, uh, you may have joined us late, but I was talking <laughs> about how uh, I write genre fiction and kind of, uh, I write a little bit of science fiction, and I write Lovecraftian type stuff, you know, Cthulhu. Actually, and I write, I, I do a lot of historical research, and um, I really like to read about, the read the decadence, like uh, Oscar Wilde and, you know, Bobby Beardsley and stuff. And I have uh, Absinthe and Arkham, which is uh, decadent Lovecraftian stories. <laughs> and uh, other type things. And I just, uh, this this is a Penny Dreadful, and, uh, yep, <laughs> the, the attraction of the Penny Dreadful. Oh, wait, we're going to the live cam. Um, so, dance, so we, dance, yeah. funny man, dance. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, all the books are great, and uh, they are, um, my name is not on this book. That's to increase sales. Anyway, um, but <laughs> can you hear the bird screaming? <laughs> can you hear anything other than the bird? Is the question. She's screaming, "Mama," because she wants my wife to come and say, "What have you been doing to that bird?" <laughs> She's like, Mama! <laughs> okay, man, it's kinky when you use a feather. It's perverted when you use the whole bird. Okay? <laughs> anyway, um, but I write I, I write uh, genre stuff. I write, I have a zombie book. I have a, I have a zomb uh, I have zombies in Vegas. It's awesome. Um, I have a Darwin literary novel. I have uh, a couple of science fiction pulpy things under the name Hugo Nabokov. And uh, they're all great. And come to seanhode.com and you can see my uh, eternally in process uh, webpage. All right, all right, now, Sean, can you tell us a little bit about what you write? <laughs> yes. Uh, just no. you and me, Jason. Jason, <laughs> sit here. Jason. Hey, Sean, oh, did you say not... you did some uh, Pulp Fiction? Yes. Oh, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I write, uh, the, as I might have mentioned, the science fiction and some horror. And uh, and um, what else do I write? I don't even remember. There's so many books of such high quality, I can't even remember them all. <laughs> Um, but uh, I, I have my Cthulhu books, and uh, I also write, I have a cryptid novel um, uh, under Hugo Nabokov. If you go to severedpress.com, and I recommend that you do, you'll find a lot of my a lot of my books there under Hugo Nabokov, and also my Cthulhu books are there. Okay. Uh, in any case, my next thing that I'm doing after I get done here and have a nice cold shower is uh, I'm going to um, be at the Henderson Library, the Green Valley branch, Napseo Verde, and I'll be giving... Um, I'm giving a presentation and, uh, you know, writing talk 
on um, an element. Oh, uh, this week it's on setting, November 18th, Saturday at the Henderson Library. And um, I'm going to be probably live Facebooking it, probably. Uh, so there'll be lots of expletives. And, and uh, yeah, and I hope uh, people will come. It's free and worth twice that much, at least. Worth twice that much. Okay. Yes. I like definitely. that. Yeah, the little addition there on the end. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Jim, let's uh, turn it back to you. What is coming up on your agenda? Well, I've got, of course, my shows next Thursday. Then I have a week off, and then I'm working on a new book, and I'm, I'm trying to put together a, a, a thing for a library here in Simi Valley, but they're not really open to anything right now. So they just, library just went public, so, or uh, private. So who knows? What? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What does a private library do? I don't. A privately, privately run. It's it's it doesn't belong to the city any longer. It belongs as privately run. Huh. Oh, so they have, they have different ideas on things. Shock. So, Sean, you look so look nice. Like, shock, anyway, look at the shock I'm, on on, on uh, her face, man. <laughs> I'm also I'm also I'm also uh, putting trying to get the money together to put together a um uh, an indie bookstore that's oh, uh, just for indie writers and and publishers. May he rest nice. in peace. But the owner, the uh, one of the owners of the uh, Amber Unicorn bookstore, died just recently. Did you know right. that, guys? Uh, -uh. uh. So that might be for sale. So I can talk to some people. Well, I want to hear towns. Are you not in Las Vegas? But no. Oh, I'm in Simi Valley, California. Oh, oh, that. Okay. It'd be a bit of a commute then. Never mind. Yeah, it would be a huge commute. Yeah. Sean, you look yeah. a little bit like Justin Timberlake from this angle. You do right I, now, yeah. That's why I'm doing this angle. Uh, I uh, here I'm trying here I'll do my Moby impression. There we go. Okay. Nice. Hey, you and I have the same haircut. Yes. Jim, get you on that. You're embarrassing us with your hair. We're oh, bringing no. sexy back. We. <laughs> no, the one embarrassing is is Katie with her pigtails. Oh. I, yeah. <laughs> Better than last week, though. Better than last week. He looks like one of those girls that would have hung out in the old west that you were talking about earlier, Jim. Oh, yeah. Put one put a the... put a headband and a feather, and she could sit there and scream Wonka Tonga. That's that's <laughs> awesome. I'm really glad you said that because I don't look as bad now, <laughs> and that's that's important. That's it. I'm going back to the acid green wig next week. I'm telling you, the, the angle is is slowly changing on you, Sean. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to do something. That doesn't have my quadruple chin. Well, it, it, it doesn't doesn't help. So I you know. have more. I know. Right? They have a beard that covered that. I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> I have more chi chins in a Chinese phone book over here. But uh, yeah. So I would like to thank uh, the people who wrote that joke in the original Sanskrit. And uh, so. all right, Katie. So Katie, what are you going to be doing? We're just completely devolved into nonsense here. <laughs> you invited me. <laughs> Wait, is he? Is that bird doing like a Marlon Brando? Is it Stella? <laughs> I think so. Uh, well, every time that Sean talks, she gets enraged. <laughs> bird rage. Well, I think it's. I think it's since Sean said I could take my pants off, and the bird has been going, "Leave them on, leave them <laughs> on." Leave them on, exactly. <laughs> well, I, I would take my pants off, and the bird would go, "You call that a perch?" <laughs> <laughs> Oh, she's dancing now. She likes that. Hey, that's right. Birds, <laughs> birds love humiliation, as you know. <laughs> Go to some writers. Yeah. <laughs> Why else would we Yeah, writers. People become writers because just being homeless, you get too much respect. See, that's right. No, I think most writers just love... You must have no Most shit. writers just love self-flagellation. <laughs> yes. Hey, leave Louis C.K. out of this. That's that's half of our job. Oh damn, Sean! Wait, what's the other half? I never got to that part. Uh, Stella, <laughs> Stella. she just says Stella. Stella. <laughs> oh, oh shit. Oh, Katie. Well, what are you working on right now? Not a damn thing. <laughs> writing a book about pigtail care no i'm i'm actually i'm in that that dreadful waiting period where i've been uh submitting to agents and editors on my latest story and you know it's kind of it's hard to write when you're like wondering if your writing is worth it right yeah i've always had that problem so i mean i'll i'll get over the hump a little bit i'm trying to push myself with nano but i've really not gotten much done i did the first day of nano 
in that I posted words that I had done before November, <laughs> and I haven't done any since. I've <laughs> rearranged some words, and I've done some text broker, and and I played some online poker, and I read some anti-Trump articles. <laughs> That's basically it. Bird hates you. <laughs> it bird hate. I know most birds are are uh, are pro-Trump. <laughs> I, they just, you know what? They just follow whatever they have in their feed. Well, I think, I think, I think owls are. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, anyway, oh, so yeah. So Katie, but... so you're doing not. So your next appearance, Katie, is nothing. You know, actually, I don't have any appearances for the rest of this year. Um, hopefully, next year I'll be able to get some bookings in. I love doing Comic Cons. Um, I like being able to uh, to get into that whole fantasy community and uh, do some talks there. But I've got nothing on the books right now. I was going to say you can you can see me five days a week at the Kingdom Animal Hospital in Holland. Oh, you're breaking I, up. What? I, I <laughs> I'm going in a tunnel. Goodbye. <laughs> well, I hope this was helpful to all the viewers out there. <laughs> You get you all learned a lot from this show. Just don't lie. Of course. If nothing else, you got a good laugh this week. <laughs> Whenever you. Jim was speaking, it was worth something. And Katie, you're ah. nice to look at. So it's all it all worked out. <laughs> so, so when we edit this, it'll just be all Jim and then the occasional laughter from the rest of us, right? Honestly, no, that would hope be not. the best with it. Just be Stella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just Jim and the bird. <laughs> yeah, me and the bird. I like it. That's quality original Actually, can content. can you tell your bird to say things that they said on Deadwood? Because then he and Jim can have this discussion. Yes. Oh, we can, oh, we can do that anyway. That's true. That's true. Well, well, guys, we're about the end of our time tonight. But this has been a fantastically hey, fun show with you two. I, I had a great it time. Been fun. <laughs> Jim, I'm looking up your stuff, man. Good. Do that. Thanks. And thanks for looking up my stuff. Thanks for saying oh, that. I will, I will look up your stuff. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you for joining us tonight on another night of Spilling Ink, the talk show that takes you behind the scenes in the publishing world, or in this case, behind the scenes in Sean's giant head over there. And I have no pants. <laughs> no, no. Oh, oh my God. God. No. Sorry. I'm like Tom Brokaw. He wore bikini bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, everybody, have a wonderful night, and we'll see you on the next episode.